please stand as you're able for our intro. Words are in your bulletin, or it's first and second verses in, on 683. heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so, so much for being with us and giving us um, this Sabbath day. We just ask that you please bless us, help us to grow closer to you, help us to learn something today, and I pray that as we have our Sabbath, um, that we are able to grow closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We please remain standing and join in hymn number 487. 487. It's now uh, time for our tithes and offering. Our loose offering today will go to our church budget and our own expenses here at home, um, which are many. <laughs> and now that the hot weather is upon us, instead of spending our money on heat, we're going to be spending it on coolness. So let's remember our, our different uh, experience, uh, expenses and uh, our ministries here at Southside Church. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here today. 
We know that we are here because of you, and we know that everything we have comes from your hand. Lord, bless these funds as they are given uh, for your intended use. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. now time for the children's story. I'm looking for children. <laughs> if there is a child in the house, <laughs> please go back and uh, get a basket. If you're not a little child, you're a child of God, so it's okay if you pick up the Lamb's Offering too. Uh, Cindy D. Hart will be giving us the Bible, uh, I mean the children's story today. <laughs> I've had to tell just one child before, but this is unusual to not have anyone. <laughs> oh, I think I see some coming. Uh, there are blue prayer cards in the pew holders, at the back of the pews. If you want to uh, have a prayer request and doing the Garden of Prayer, then you can bring them forward and put them in my Bible. So we do have some children that are coming in for this story. We've already collected the money, though, kids. <laughs> That's the fun part for them. <laughs> Years ago, uh, one of our late. little children who's now in high school came, came by me and I gave him a whole bunch of change and he looked at me, this was Austin. Very seriously, he said, I was hoping for a dollar. <laughs> so I was sure to have a dollar for that kid after that. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right, I'm going to teach you a word. The word is repel. Repel or repellent. Do you know what a repellent is? Well, I'm going to show you some things that can be considered repellents, okay? Um, let me see. Mothball. 
mothballs. Have you ever heard of mothballs? No. Oh, they stink. Smell. <laughs> Smell. <laughs> You know what they repel? <laughs> They're called mothballs. What's on the front? A moth. Mothballs repel moths. You put them in your clothes, in your closets, in your um, chest, coat chest, and it keeps the moths out because moths will eat through some of your clothes, like wool. What else do I have? Oh. You know what this is? This is like a repellent and protected. And it protects your lips from the sun and the wind. It keeps them from getting dried out. Why? Kind of repels the sun. The well, my lips are dried out. Are they? Are you hinting? <laughs> Let me see what I... Oh, looky here. Bug repellent. And you spray this on and what does it repel? Bugs. Bugs, ticks, mosquitoes. Yeah, it's another repellent. Ooh, here's a shampoo for dogs, or any animals, like dogs or cats. It repels flea, no, not fish. No, no, they don't, this is for fleas and ticks, and fish don't get fleas and ticks. What else do I have? Ooh, you know what this is? It's waterproofer. You spray it on your shoes or your leather products or suede, and it keeps, it repels the water. Huh. Sun tan lotion has SPF in it. It repels when you're out in the sun, the sun rays, so you don't get sunburned so easily. Here's, here's something that repels rain again. Only this is for cars. You can wax your car with this. When it rains, the water beads right up and rolls right off. You'll never guess what this one is. This is repellent for odors. It's deodorant. It repels odors. You, huh? You, you have odors sometimes? Okay. Ooh, stuff you put on your face helps repel the sun. Why am I telling you about repellent? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I just read something this week that made me think of the devil. The devil? The devil. I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I called it, can you read it? What does it say? Satan's slave. No, Satan's salve. Salve, S-A-L-V-E. You said slave, S-L-A-V-E, but that goes along with it, doesn't it? Satan is sad, and it repels sin. So what would you think if I told you that this salve, if you put it on over your body, Satan can't bother us. He can't tempt us. You're itchy? You want some Satan sad? Maybe that's the devil trying to get into you. There we go. Does that feel better? Yeah. I think it works, maybe. It smells good. It does smell good. Would you like to have one? I'll let you have one when you go back. Get ready to go back to your seat. But I was thinking when I thought about the salve and the repellent, wouldn't it be nice? If there was a salve you could put on every day before you greet the world, on your, but what would we do about our eyes? We'd still see things because we can't put the salve in our eyes. What about in our mouths? We can't put it in our mouths, so maybe we'll say things we shouldn't. Can't put it in our ears. It itches in your mouth? Well, you can't put Satan's salve in your mouth. It says it repels what? Sin. Wouldn't that be neat if we had something like this to keep us clean? But we don't. We have something even easier and better. Do you know what it is? Can you guess what repels Satan? Prayer. Prayer is the only way we are going to repel Satan. We can't have a salve 
We can't put anything in our eyes, our ears, our mouth, our hands to keep us from doing anything wrong. But we do have prayer. And we have one more thing. God's Word. So, in Sabbath school, when you guys are flaking around and not paying attention to what Miss Julie says, guess who's trying to get inside your little hearts? Satan. Satan. And if I could spray Satan salve on you, I would, but I can't. But if you listen to the stories that Julie tells, if you listen to the sermons, there's a reason we need to listen and there's a reason we need to read our Bibles. And there was a great verse that would go today with the children's story, but I didn't want to give it because I wanted to tell you a verse I like even better. It says, Listen, you inhabitants of Southside Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude of sins. For the battle is not yours, but God's. So do we need Satan's salve? No. What do we have instead? Prayer and the Bible. I am going to ask you to have a quick little prayer with me before you go back to your seats. And I'm going to give you each a little bit of Satan salve. Although it's not really. <laughs> but it is packed with prayer. <laughs> All right, let's fold our hands and close our eyes, okay? It does smell good, doesn't it? Dear Jesus, help us, Lord. We're always being dogged by Satan and his evil minions. Protect us, Lord. Every, each and every day, protect us. Help us to read our Bibles and help us to pray nonstop to you for your love and your protection. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Now I want you to walk back to your seat. It's okay. Thank you, Miss Cindy and boys and girls. It's now time for our gardener prayer. If you have a prayer request on one of the blue cards, please bring it forward and place it in my Bible. And you're welcome to join us up front here for prayer. Or if you're more comfortable at your seat, that's fine too. Happy Sabbath, family. Happy Sabbath. Um, you know, I told you my sister-in-law, Kathy, for some reason doesn't have any white blood cells right now. But she did find out yesterday that she does not have cancer. So, and they do have um, something that they're giving her to treat her to get those little baby cells to work in again. So please continue to keep her in your prayers and thank you for all your prayers so far so I've got one of the truly thank you Lord uh, thoughts today uh, I was working in Illinois yesterday and was coming back home last night in the rain and so forth I'd actually had stopped to wait for the rain to go away but it, if you haven't driven I-74 recently, it's basically just the whole thing is one lane. It's all in a construction. And I'd uh, gotten back on the road from Crawfordsville, and I'm going in this, you know, there's concrete to the left and guardrail to the right. And I look up with alarm as this 18 wheelers uh, rolling down on my back. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm playing a pinball bouncing off the side of, of, the, of the metal and the, of, and the concrete. And the next thing you know, I'm four-wheeling through the mud on the side of the road and then finally run into a tree. And uh, once I had found my glasses and my phone and all that, uh, there's a knock on my door and I open it up and uh, this lady starts interrogating me as to, you know, how do I feel this and that. Well, it turns out she was a doctor and, and had been a paramedic. 
And so, you know, again, you know, what kind of happenstance would this be? And uh, so once the police do their thing, so forth, she had helped load all the stuff in, in the car, all my camera gear and all that, because I'm too sore to lift much of anything. And so then as we're driving, I realize she's interrogating me to see what my mental acuity is and this and that. And so, and then as we get closer to Indy, she's telling me all the things I need to do to take care of myself. And you know, you need to ice yourself, you need to breathe deeply, this and that. So I have to praise the Lord that, uh, you know, A, I'm alive and, and the tree didn't do me in, and B, that there was this doctor right there. And no, you know, nobody else had stopped, but she did. So anyway, praise the Lord and thank you. Amen. You know, people do experience close calls like that, but he had the mercy of the Lord with him. And I think in heaven, I, I just keep thinking it's going to be revealed to us how many close calls we had and didn't even know. I do think the Lord does that, protects us sometimes when we don't even know it. So we are thankful for his goodness and his mercy and for the testimonies here today. All who are able, please kneel. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your goodness and your mercies and your loving care for us. We're so grateful to be here today and just um, pulled apart from our everyday challenges. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for the times that we have fallen short this week and maybe forgot to pay attention to your voice at times or to do things that we should have done differently. Lord, we are so thankful for your forgiveness and for your saving mercies for your children. Uh, Father, I'm happy to see Brother George Humphrey here today after going through the procedure and the stent and everything that he had this week. Lord, I just pray that you continue to watch over him and strengthen him and be with uh, his family and, and bless them. We think of Brother Jerry D. Hart, who um, has had a downturn. But we pray, Lord, that you will strengthen him and heal him so that um, he can soon be back with us. And, Lord, there are all the other um, shut-ins, our people in the nursing homes, those who cannot be here because they are infirm or sometimes, Lord, just too tired and not the energy to be able to be here. So, Father, we ask that you look upon them today and give them an extra measure of faith and courage and comfort. Lord, uh, we have these prayer requests in my Bible, and I know that there are others that maybe did not turn in a blue prayer card, but Lord, um, they have praises, but they also have requests family, for family, for salvation, for family or co-workers, for healing, for family or friends, um, financial issues. Father, I just pray for all of those that are on this in these blue prayer cards and for everyone else who are dealing with whatever issue it might be. Father, just bless my brothers and sisters here and their families. And I ask, Father, that you be with Linda today as she brings us a sermon and about our experiences. So thankful, Lord, that we have young people that are true to you and are to um, continue to carry uh, our message to the world. We thank you, Father, again for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Special music today will be brought to us by Brothers Boo and Cash, I mean Cross. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be blessed by it.
Well, while we're just uh, getting set up, um, you know, I've done just about every other job in this church except for special music. I hope I don't torture you all too much today. You know, when we look at the weather outside and sometimes the rain comes and the sun comes, Matthew 5.45 tells us that, you know, God sends the sun and the, uh, uh, the rain to come down on the righteous and the unrighteous. And what he's telling us is none of us are perfect, but he loves us all and he provides. So this song really touches my heart and I wanted to share it with you. <clears throat> Roger and Chris. That's great. Our scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 14, verse 18, under the parable of the Great Supper. 
but they all with one accord begin to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Our speaker again today, I gave you some background on her beforehand, Ms. Linda Morris, so we're happy to have her today. Thank you guys for having me. Um, not sure if I've been to this church before, maybe when I was in high school. I don't know if the music department ever came here and performed or whatnot, but thank you for having me. Uh, I do see a, a couple familiar faces. Um, I'm just gonna say a quick prayer uh, before, I, before I start speaking. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you please Please speak through me. I ask that the words that come from my, from my mouth are from you and that uh, we are all able to learn something today to grow closer to you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, like she introduced me, I've been in the Middle East for the last uh, nine months because I was going to school there. I was attempting, attempting, I say, to learn Arabic. Um, didn't go quite as well as I wanted, but I'll, I'll greet you in, in, in Arabic. Marhaba, it's hello in Arabic. So I'm gonna start off with just a little story. The title of the sermon is called Blind Eyes. And when I was, I want to say about five years old, I think I was, I think I was around five years old, um, I was a naughty little girl because I wanted to pump the gas, but my grandmother wouldn't let me. And I was so determined to pump it uh, that when she put the nozzle into the car, she clicked it so that she didn't have to hold it and she leaned against the car and she was just staring at the road. And so I, I leaned out the door and I, I saw her and uh, I uh, decided to take the uh, nozzle out of the, out of the car and I ended up getting gas all over me. And it was, it was really bad. It was like in my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my nose, it just like drenched me. And I started screaming bloody murder. And I can remember feeling like, well one, first it hurt because it really burned my eyes, but I can also remember feeling so helpless because I couldn't see. Like, it's one of the basic things that we have that keeps us safe and that lets us know that we are you know, okay. But when you don't have your sight, something's not right. You know, it doesn't feel right. So I can still remember uh, that feeling of not knowing if I was going to be able to see again. Um, but I'll touch back on that at the end of uh, my little talk. So I wanted to share a parable with you guys today. Uh, it starts in Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 15. And I'm just going to read it uh, from the beginning to the end, and then I will hit some points in it. And this is what it says. Now, when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, Jesus, reciting this parable, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. Verse 18. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Verse 20, still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house 
became angry, being angry, said to his servant, Go, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go, go out into the highways and the hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Verse 24 says, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Now, when I look at it, just, just as a glance, clearly, clearly it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about, you know, God inviting um, these people. And let's say, okay, now it's the second coming and, and everything's ready. You know, like God's, Jesus is coming back. God is ready to have us into his house, the kingdom of heaven. But yet, not everybody's going to be ready. Correct? Not every person in this room might be ready when that time comes. These men certainly were not ready. These people that gave excuses. But was it just because they weren't ready? Or was it because they didn't want to be ready? The statement that prompted the parable is key to understanding this. The man in verse 15 looks forward to dining in the kingdom of heaven of God, the kingdom of heaven, probably thinking that this would be uh, just awarded to the Jews. That he could see in his mind that all the Jewish people are going to be up in heaven celebrating in the kingdom of God. But the parable that Jesus tell is aimed towards just completely getting rid of this, this idea that it's only going to be the Jews that are in heaven. You can see several points in the Bible where um, God specifically points out that it's not going to be just the Jews in heaven. It's going to be the Gentiles, too, because God is not picky when it comes to letting those in his house. He is like, think of, the, think of a person in your life who showed you the best hospitality that you've ever known. Now, God is like, like way above that. Like his hospitality level is just like, that's what we should strive to do. Like inviting people into our house, giving them food, you know, giving them a place to sleep, uh, just showing them love. Like this is what God does. This is, this is who he is. His hospitality is second to none. Amen. So it talks about this, the master of the house is God and the great banquet is the kingdom. A metaphor that suggests that was suggested by the speaker at the table who prompted this parable. And the, you go on and you can see some more. The invited guest pictured the Jewish nation, that the kingdom was prepared for them, but when Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near, he was rejected. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. John 1, 1 says... I'm going to do a quick jump right here. John 1, verse 11 says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is so beautiful, right? It's like, there's something that I want to do in my life, and when I, every time I tell people, they just don't understand. They just can't comprehend the fact that I don't want to have my own kids. I want to adopt. That's my plan. Hopefully, um, I can find a husband that is okay with not having his own kids. And, you know, that might be a lot to ask. 
Every time that I talk about this to people, they're just like, oh, but, but don't you want your own kid? Don't you want a little mini me? Don't you want like somebody that just embodies you and your husband? I'm like, uh, no. I don't need another me out in this world. I, this world has enough with me. But there are so many little kids out in this world that need homes. And everybody says, oh, but you don't know what problems they come with. You don't know. Their, their parents might have been drug addicts. My parents are drug addict. My parents were drug addicts. Oh, but you know, they might have health issues. I have health issues. Oh, but, but you don't know what their personality is going to be. You know what? My personality is one of the most challenging personalities for people because I am beyond bold. People don't like me sometimes because I'm too loud. So whatever personality my kid has is going to be okay. But this is what God does. He doesn't care about the blood. He doesn't care about where you came from or what... I wouldn't say he doesn't care what you do. He does care what you do, but he doesn't care where you come from. And that is beautiful. So let's go to these excuses that it's talking about. And these people can't come to this great banquet. Oh, food is my favorite. I love food. So it's going to have to be something really, really important for me to miss coming to free food, right? The excuses for skipping this banquet were as follows. One, um, let's go, verse, verse 18 it says, I bought a piece of land and I'm going to check it out. Excuse number two is I have bought some, some ox, some oxen, it's a plural. And I need to try them out, I need to test them. And the last one is I've married a wife. I've married a woman, I have a wife now, so I can't come. Okay, who buys a piece of property without ever seeing it? Okay, I'm not gonna buy a piece of land in the, for, without seeing it unless it's like one dollar. Like if it's super cheap, I might buy it without looking. But chances are, you don't have money to waste on something that you don't know is gonna tur not turn out. Number two, this guy buys these animals and assuming these are going to be working animals. So who's going to buy animals that are supposed to work for you without seeing the condition that they're in? Without seeing if they're healthy or able to work for you? It's like hiring somebody without knowing anything about them. Most employers don't want to do that because they want to guarantee that when they hire you they're not wasting their time. And nobody's going to want to waste money on, an, on these animals that can't do anything. And number three, what married couple cannot come to a social event? He's, he's married to, to a wife, and usually, usually women like to go to social events. So what's his true reason? All these reasons, on the surface, they might look like, yeah, like you do need to check out a piece of property. Like that's kind of important. Yeah, you do need to make sure that your animals are working. Yeah, like you need to like spend time with your wife. But these are all something that could have been done previously if you'd manage your time. And apparently these guys aren't managing their time or something because they're giving these excuses these flimsy excuses. And so the master of the house knows and sees through these, these excuses that they have, these, these problems that cannot be taken care of later. The detail in this story all comes to me. The most important part is the end. The master says, okay, if they're not going to come, invite everybody else. Invite the poor and the lame and the maimed and the blind and have them come in. Because if these people don't want to come into my house, then I will invite the people that nobody ever invites. 
And so his servant goes out to the alleyways and the streets, and he brings these people in, but the master's like, you know what? I still have room. Go a little bit farther. Go to the highways. Find these people and bring them into my house. I want my house full. Amen, right? I want the kingdom of heaven full. The detail that the invitation is opened up to societies maimed and downtrodden is important. These were the types of people that the Pharisees considered unclean under God's curse. And Jesus, however, taught that the kingdom was available to those even considered unclean. Even available to those that society looks down on. The people with the tattoos. The people that are homeless. The people that have five kids and are just struggling from paycheck to paycheck. The drug addicts. The deadbeat father. The people that everybody looks down on in society, God loves even them. And God is inviting even them into this, this place. And what really hits me is that these people, these, these people that have this idea that the kingdom of heaven is only for their people, how can you, how can you deny somebody something so beautiful? How can, you, how can you have what you have and keep what you have and never, ever share it? How can, when you have such great news, the best news that this world has ever had, how can you keep it to yourself? His involvement with the tax collectors and the sinners brought condemnation from the Pharisees, yet it showed the extent of God's grace. The fact that the master in the parable sends the servant far out to persuade everyone to come indicates that the salvation that would be extended would be extended even to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. But the master is not satisfied with just a half full banquet. He wants it full. Hosea chapter 2, 23 says... Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. It's beautiful. It's beautiful what God does. I'm coming to closing down now, and, and this is what I want you to think about. I believe, from my personal opinion, when I look at this story, there are two key components. You have the excuses, and then you have the people that are invited after they don't come. I want you to personally evaluate yourself. What kind of excuses are you making in your life? Don't just think about, don't just think about this parable as just the kingdom of heaven, but think about it as an opportunity. Think about this person comes to you and says, hey, look, I have this opportunity. I don't know what that opportunity might be for you. I'll just give an example for myself. Hey, um, Linda, I just want to know, I have this opportunity, full expenses paid, um, there's, you don't need uh, a bachelor's degree or anything, but we really need some help uh, with this uh, mission work or this, this place, and we need, we need an extra hand. Um, can you come and, and, and help us and help build this place up and, and be somebody that, uh, that can oversee these? 
my dream is to one day be able to work with a company like um, AFM or, or ADRA. I don't know if I'll ever do it, but right now that's something that I would love to do. And if someone op offered me an opportunity to be able to work my way up into doing something like that, I would be very, very hard pressed to say no. Because to get any of those positions at this moment, you need a bachelor's degree. They require you to finish college. And I, and I haven't yet, so I can't take any of those opportunities. Those opportunities are far and few between. But what opportunity would you pass up or would you take? What excuses are you making, not just in your daily life, but for opportunities that come your way? I have one invitation for you, and that invitation is to be the servant in this story. The servant that goes out to invite the poor, the lame, the maimed, and the blind. But how much greater could it be if you were not just the servant, but the person that was invited originally and actually came? How much greater would it be if all of these men had, had come and seen how much space was available and said, excuse me, master of the house, but I feel like there's so much more room to fill. Can we invite more people? The master of the house would gladly say yes. How much more would it be if these original men that gave these excuses had not only come, but brought their neighbors, brought their friends, brought strangers, brought people that just needed a little bit of help. We have a responsibility to God and ourself. If you didn't know about the Adventist church or you didn't know about God at all, wouldn't you want somebody to reach out to you? Wouldn't you want somebody to be like, look, I have this amazing news and I can't keep it to myself. I need to share this with you. What if nobody ever did that? What if you never got that opportunity? How many of you have been converted into the Adventist church? How many of you were born into the Adventist church? Okay, good for both bunch. This is, this is an opportunity. This is your opportunity. And it's so good that how can you pass it up? God gave us passion, and he gave us responsibility, and he gave us things to care about. But there's something that we do in our day-to-day -day life. And what we do is every day, we basically put a blindfold on. And what that blindfold does is it, is it helps us to, to live. It helps us to be happy. I, I um, about a year or so ago, I was sitting at McDonald's and I was crying like super just devastated because I was watching these videos about the Syrian refugees and it just broke my heart. I was so devastated because I couldn't do anything from where I was sitting. I, I had nothing to do. I, I, I felt so helpless. And when we see these stories, don't we feel helpless? <clears throat> Don't we feel moved? How, how many of you, raise of hands, saw a story about these little kids in Syria losing their parents and tell me that you felt something? Tell me that you felt something. Because how can you not hear about, not just there, but in America? How can you hear about these stories, these school shootings, and not feel something? 
this blindfold that we put on, I realized myself that I was putting it on because it helps us to go about our daily lives and to not feel so much pain that this world has. Because eventually those news stories, they stop. I didn't see any more stories except the occasional like post on Facebook. I didn't hear the news reporting about the Syrian, the Syrian refugees or the Syrians being bombed or anything like that. It just kind of like disappeared. And I thought one day, oh, maybe, maybe it's over. But it wasn't over. The news in society had deemed, we've talked about this enough. Because nobody likes to see pain every day. It just brings you down. You feel sad and depressed, and, and it's, it's not something that the news stations want to keep talking about. They want to make their viewers happy. When I was, when I had the gasoline in my eyes, the thing that made it so scary was that I didn't have a blindfold on. When you put a blindfold on, I don't know how many of you guys have ever done those little exercises as a kid to experience what it's, what it's like to be blind, but they, the teacher will generally like, like move the desks to a little like, you know, like little pathway or something like that, and, and somebody puts a blindfold on and then somebody else has to lead them by their voice or something like that, and, and you get to experience what it's like to be blind. But you can't really experience what it's like to be blind because you know that you can take that blindfold off. And we put these blindfolds on every day to shield ourselves from this pain that isn't ours. It's not our pain, but yet we feel it. And we put these blindfolds on so that we can keep going about our day and ignore the things that are happening in this world. Sometimes, though you take the blindfold off for something that you care about, every once in a while you find something that you're passionate about. Every once in a while, you find something that you care about. And so that's when you start to take your blindfold off and you start to let yourself open up to this pain because it's something that you want to do or something that you want to help. But I'm, but I'm here to invite you to take your blindfold off for things that you might not care about. Because if people only take their blindfolds off for things that they care about, not everybody would be helped. There would be people not invited. And so I'm asking you, I am begging you to find something that you might not necessarily do if you had a choice. Sometimes doing the things that we aren't passionate about can even lead us to finding something that we are passionate about. I've done many things, and some of them I didn't like, some of them I did. But one thing that helped me is I realized, okay, I don't really want to be a teacher. This is something that I've done. I've, I've taught English as a second language and I've done this and, and I realized that I didn't necessarily want to do that as a career. And that helped me to shape who I am and it helped me in other ways. So these things that you do in your life, every once in a while take a blindfold off and help people that you wouldn't normally help. Because this kingdom is so open right now. There are so many seats available. Look, at, look around you. There's so many spots available in these pews. And maybe you could invite somebody that you wouldn't normally invite. Somebody just told me, my last thing, I'll, I'll just share this. Somebody just recently told me that um, they were talking to this guy and, uh, 
they got on the subject of Adventism. And this guy says, oh yeah, you know, I've lived, I've lived next to these, uh, this family of Adventists for, I don't, know, uh, I don't know, 10 years or eight years or something like that. You, you know, they've never invited me to church. Now, I'm not saying go preach to everybody, but every once in a while, step out of your comfort zone. Because imagine if you were the person that was blind or lame. Because those are the people that need our help. And it's not just them, it's your neighbors, it's, it's anybody. You can never judge a book by the cover. So I invite you today to not only get rid of your excuses, but to say, God, I'll come. But not only God, I will come, I will bring my neighbor. Please stand as you're able for hymn number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 100.
Let's bow our heads. God, you are so good. You are beyond good. And the grace that you have extended us, we don't deserve. But we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for reaching out to us. And we thank you for never, ever giving up on us. And we ask to be your vessel. We ask to be used by you, God. Give us an opportunity that we can grab onto and maybe, maybe, just maybe, we can reach out to this person. Give us the courage that we need, God, to be able to be the servant, to go out and seek these people out and to invite them into your home. Help us to be brave, God, because that's what we need. And help us to see the people that we'd norm we wouldn't normally see. Help us to remove our blindfolds, to see the things that we need to see. I ask this in your son's precious name. Amen.